Henrik Ibsen, Henrik Johann Ibsen, March 20, 1828, May 23, 1906, was a Norwegian playwright, theatre director, and poet. As one of the founders of modernism in theatre, Ibsen is often referred to as the father of realism and one of the most influential playwrights of his time. His major works include Brand, Peer Gint, An Enemy of the People, Emperor and Galilean, A Doll's House, Hedda Gobbler, Ghosts, The Wild Duck, When We Dead Awaken, Pillars of Society, The Lady from the Sea, Rosmersum, The Master Builder, and John Gabriel Borkman. He is the most frequently performed dramatist in the world after Shakespeare, and by the early 20th century A Doll's House became the world's most performed play. Several of his later dramas were considered scandalous to many of his era. When European theatre was expected to model strict morals of family life and propriety. Ibsen's later work examined the realities that lay behind the facades, revealing much that was disquieting to a number of his contemporaries. He had a critical eye and conducted a free inquiry into the conditions of life and issues of morality. His early poetic and cinematic play Pierre Gint, however, has also strong surreal elements. Ibsen is often ranked as one of the most distinguished playwrights in the European tradition. Richard Hornby describes him as a profound poetic dramatist, the best since Shakespeare. He is widely regarded as the most important playwright since Shakespeare. He influenced other playwrights and novelists such as George Bernard Shaw, Oscar Wilde, Arthur Miller, James Joyce, Eugene O'Neill, and Miroslav Karlaza. Ibsen was nominated for the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1902, 1903, and 1904. Ibsen wrote his plays in Danish, the common written language of Denmark and Norway during his lifetime, and they were published by the Danish publisher Gullendal. Although most of his plays are set in Norway, often in places reminiscent of Sheen, the port town where he grew up, Ibsen lived for 27 years in Italy and Germany, and rarely visited Norway during his most productive years. Born into a merchant family connected to the Patriciate of Sheen, Ibsen shaped his dramas according to his family background. He was the father of Prime Minister Sigurd Ibsen. Ibsen's dramas have a strong influence upon contemporary culture. Ibsen was born to Knud Ibsen, 1797-1877, and Marikan Altenberg, 1799-1869, into a well-to-do merchant family, in the small port town of Sheehan in Telemark County, a city which was noted for shipping timber. As he wrote in an 1882 letter to critic and scholar Georg Brands, my parents were members on both sides of the most respected families in Sheehan, explaining that he was closely related with just about all the patrician families who then dominated the place and its surroundings, mentioning the families Paus, Plesner, van der Lippe, Koppelen, and Blom. Ibsen's grandfather, ship captain Henrik Ibsen, 1765-1797, had died at sea in 1797 and Knud Ibsen was raised on the estate of shipowner Old Paus, 1766-1855, after his mother Joanne, Plesner, 1770-1847, remarried. Knud Ibsen's half-brothers included lawyer and politician Christian Cornelius Paus, banker and shipowner Christopher Blom Paus, and lawyer Henrik Johan Paus, who grew up with Ibsen's mother in the Altenburg home and after whom Henrik, Johan, Ibsen was named. Knud Ibsen's paternal ancestors were ship captains of Danish origin, but he decided to become a merchant, and had some initial success. His marriage to Marikan Altenberg, a daughter of shipowner Johann Andreas Altenberg, 1763 1824, and Hedevig Christine Paus, 1763 1848, was a successful match. Theodore Jorgensen points out that Henrik's ancestry, thus, reached back into the important Telemark family of Paus both on the father's and on the mother's side. Hedvig Paus must have been well known to the young dramatist, for she lived until 1848. Henrik Ibsen was fascinated by his parents' strange, almost incestuous marriage, and would treat the subject of incestuous relationships in several plays, notably his masterpiece Rosmersum. When Henrik Ibsen was around seven years old, however, his father's fortunes took a significant turn for the worse, and the family was eventually forced to sell the major Altenburg building in central Sheen and move permanently to their small summer house, then stop, outside of the city. Henrik's sister Hedvig would write about their mother, she was a quiet, lovable woman, the soul of the house, everything to her husband and children. She sacrificed herself time and time again. There was no bitterness or reproach in her. The Ibsen family eventually moved to a city house, Snipe at Warp, owned by Knud Ibsen's half-brother, wealthy banker and shipowner Christopher Blompaus. 
His father's financial ruin would have a strong influence on Ibsen's later work, the characters in his plays often mirror his parents, and his themes often deal with issues of financial difficulty as well as moral conflicts stemming from dark secrets hidden from society. Ibsen would both model and name characters in his plays after his own family. A central theme in Ibsen's plays is the portrayal of suffering women, echoing his mother Marikan Altenberg. Ibsen's sympathy with women would eventually find significant expression with their portrayal in dramas such as A Doll's House and Rosmerism. At 15, Ibsen was forced to leave school. He moved to the small town of Grimstead to become an apprentice pharmacist and began writing plays. In 1846, when Ibsen was 18, he had liaison with Else Sophie Jenstadter Berkadale, in which produced a son, Hans Jacob Hendrickson Berkdalen, whose upbringing Ibsen paid for until the boy was 14 though Ibsen never saw Hans Jacob. Ibsen went to Christiania, later renamed Christiania and then Oslo, intending to matriculate at the university. He soon rejected the idea, his earlier attempts at entering university were blocked as he did not pass all his entrance exams, preferring to commit himself to writing. His first play, The Tragedy Catalina, 1850, was published under the pseudonym Bringe Elf Charm, when he was only 22, but it was not performed. His first play to be staged, The Burial Mound, 1850, received little attention. Still, Ibsen was determined to be a playwright, although the numerous plays he wrote in the following years remained unsuccessful. Ibsen's main inspiration in the early period, right up to Pierre Gint, was apparently the Norwegian author Henrik Wergeland and the Norwegian folk Thalesses collected by Peter Christen Osbjørnsen and Jurgen Mo. In Ibsen's youth, Wergeland was the most acclaimed, and by far the most read, Norwegian poet and playwright. He spent the next several years employed at Det Norske Theater, Bergen, where he was involved in the production of more than 145 plays as a writer, director, and producer. During this period, he published five new, though largely unremarkable, plays. Despite Ibsen's failure to achieve success as a playwright, he gained a great deal of practical experience at the Norwegian Theater, experience that was to prove valuable when he continued writing. Ibsen returned to Christiania in 1858 to become the creative director of the Christiania Theatre. He married Susanna Thorison on June 18, 1858 and she gave birth to their only child Sigurd on December 23, 1859. The couple lived in very poor financial circumstances and Ibsen became very disenchanted with life in Norway. In 1864, he left Christiania and went to Sorrento in Italy in self-imposed exile. He didn't return to his native land for the next 27 years, and when he returned to it he was a noted, but controversial, playwright. His next play, Brand, 1865, brought him the critical acclaim he sought, along with a measure of financial success, as did the following play, Pierre Gint, 1867, to which Edvard Grieg famously composed incidental music and songs. Although Ibsen read excerpts of the Danish philosopher Søren and Kierkegaard and traces of the latter's influence are evident in Brand, it was not until after Brand that Ibsen came to take Kierkegaard seriously. Initially annoyed with his friend Georg Brands for comparing Brand to Kierkegaard, Ibsen nevertheless read either Slash or In Fear and Trembling. Ibsen's next play Peergint was consciously informed by Kierkegaard. With success, Ibsen became more confident and began to introduce more and more of his own beliefs and judgments into the drama exploring what he termed the drama of ideas. His next series of plays are often considered his golden age, when he entered the height of his power and influence, becoming the center of dramatic controversy across Europe. Ibsen moved from Italy to Dresden, Germany, in 1868, where he spent years writing the play he regarded as his main work, Emperor and Galilean, 1873, dramatizing the life and times of the Roman Emperor Julian the Apostate. Although Ibsen himself always looked back on this play as the cornerstone of his entire works, very few shared his opinion, and his next works would be much more acclaimed. Ibsen moved to Munich in 1875 and began work on his first contemporary realist drama The Pillars of Society, first published and performed in 1877. A Doll's House followed in 1879. This play is a scathing criticism of the marital roles accepted by men and women which characterized Ibsen's society. Ghosts followed in 1881, another scathing commentary on the morality of Ibsen's society, in which a widow reveals to her pastor that she had hidden the evils of her marriage for its duration. The pastor had advised her to marry her fiancé despite his philandering, and she did so in the belief that her love would reform him. But his philandering continued right up until his death, 
and his vices are passed on to their son in the form of syphilis. The mention of venereal disease alone was scandalous, but to show how it could poison a respectable family was considered intolerable. In An Enemy of the People, 1882, Ibsen went even further. In earlier plays, controversial elements were important and even pivotal components of the action, but they were on the small scale of individual households. In An Enemy, controversy became the primary focus, and the antagonist was the entire community. One primary message of the play is that the individual, who stands alone, is more often right than the mass of people, who are portrayed as ignorant and sheep like. Contemporary society's belief was that the community was a noble institution that could be trusted, a notion Ibsen challenged. In an enemy of the people, Ibsen chastised not only the conservatism of society, but also the liberalism of the time. He illustrated how people on both sides of the social spectrum could be equally self serving. An enemy of the people was written as a response to the people who had rejected his previous work, Ghosts. The plot of the play is a veiled look at the way people reacted to the plot of Ghosts. The protagonist is a physician in a vacation spot whose primary draw is a public bath. The doctor discovers that the water is contaminated by the local tannery. He expects to be acclaimed for saving the town from the nightmare of infecting visitors with disease, but instead he is declared an enemy of the people by the locals, who band against him and even throw stones through his windows. The play ends with his complete ostracism. It is obvious to the reader that disaster is in store for the town as well as for the doctor. As audiences by now expected, Ibsen's next play again attacked entrenched beliefs and assumptions, but this time, his attack was not against society's mores, but against overeager reformers and their idealism. Always an iconoclast, Ibsen was equally willing to tear down the ideologies of any part of the political spectrum, including his own. The Wild Duck, 1884, is by many considered Ibsen's finest work, and it is certainly the most complex. It tells the story of Gregor's Whirl, a young man who returns to his hometown after an extended exile and is reunited with his boyhood friend Hjalmar Ekdal. Over the course of the play, the many secrets that lie behind the Ekdal's apparently happy home are revealed to Gregor's, who insists on pursuing the absolute truth, or the summons of the ideal. Among these truths, Gregor's father impregnated his servant Gina, then married her off to Hjalmar to legitimize the child. Another man has been disgraced and imprisoned for a crime the Elder World committed. Furthermore, while Hjalmar spends his days working on a wholly imaginary invention, his wife is earning the household income. Ibsen displays masterful use of irony, despite his dogmatic insistence on truth, Gregors never says what he thinks but only insinuates, and is never understood until the play reaches its climax. Gregors hammers away at Hjalmar through innuendo and coded phrases until he realizes the truth, Gina's daughter, Hedvig, is not his child. Blinded by Gregor's insistence on absolute truth, he disavows the child. Seeing the damage he has wrought, Gregor's determines to repair things, and suggests to Hedvig that she sacrifice the wild duck, her wounded pet, to prove her love for Hjalmar. Hedvig, alone among the characters, recognizes that Gregor's always speaks in code, and looking for the deeper meaning in the first important statement Gregor's makes which does not contain own kills herself rather than the duck in order to prove her love for him in the ultimate act of self-sacrifice. Only too late do Hjalmar and Gregors realize that the absolute truth of the ideal is sometimes too much for the human heart to bear. Late in his career, Ibsen turned to a more introspective drama that had much less to do with denunciations of society's moral values and more to do with the problems of individuals. In such later plays as Hedda Gobbler, 1890, and The Master Builder, 1892, Ibsen explored psychological conflicts that transcended a simple rejection of current conventions. Many modern readers, who might regard anti-Victorian didacticism as dated, simplistic or hackneyed, have found these later works to be of absorbing interest for their hard-edged, objective consideration of interpersonal confrontation. Hedda Gobbler is probably Ibsen's most performed play, with the title role regarded as one of the most challenging and rewarding for an actress even in the present day. Hedda Gobbler in A Doll's House Center on Female Protagonists Whose Almost Demonic Energy Proves Both Attractive and Destructive for Those Around Them, and while Hedda has a few similarities with the character of Nora in A Doll's House, many of today's audiences and theater critics feel that Hedda's intensity and drive are much more complex and much less comfortably explained than what they view as rather routine feminism on the part of Nora.
Ibsen had completely rewritten the rules of drama with a realism which was to be adopted by Chekhov and others and which we see in the theater to this day. From Ibsen forward, challenging assumptions and directly speaking about issues has been considered one of the factors that makes a play art rather than entertainment. His works were brought to an English speaking audience, largely thanks to the efforts of William Archer and Edmund Goss. These in turn had a profound influence on the young James Joyce who venerates him in his early autobiographical novel Stephen Hero. Ibsen returned to Norway in 1891, but it was in many ways not the Norway he had left. Indeed, he had played a major role in the changes that had happened across society. Modernism was on the rise, not only in the theater, but across public life. Ibsen intentionally obscured his influences. However, asked later what he had read when he wrote Catiline, Ibsen replied that he had read only the Danish Norse saga-inspired romantic tragedy in Adam Holmschlager and Ludwig Holberg. The Scandinavian Moliere. BBC Radio 4's In Our Time from Thursday, May 31, 2018 www.bbc.co.uk slash program slash B0B42Q58. On May 23, 1906, Ibsen died in his home at Arbens Gate 1 in Christiania, now Oslo, after a series of strokes in March 1900. When, on 22nd of May, his nurse assured a visitor that he was a little better, Ibsen splattered his last words on the contrary, Vertimod. He died the following day at 2.30 p.m. Ibsen was buried in Vorfrelser's Gravland, the graveyard of Our Savior, in central Oslo. The 100th anniversary of Ibsen's death in 2006 was commemorated with an Ibsen year in Norway and other countries. This year the home-building company Selvag also opened Piergint Sculpture Park in Oslo, Norway, in Henrik Ibsen's honor making it possible to follow the dramatic play Peer Gint scene by scene. Wilino's adaptation of Ibsen's Peer Gint, titled Gannett, had its world premiere at the 37th Humana Festival of New American Plays in March 2013. On May 23, 2006, the Ibsen Museum in Oslo reopened to the public the house where Ibsen had spent his last 11 years, completely restored with the original interior, colors, and decor. On the occasion of the 100th anniversary of Ibsen's death in 2006, the Norwegian government organized the Ibsen Year, which included celebrations around the world. The NRK produced a miniseries on Ibsen's childhood and youth in 2006, An Immortal Man. Several prizes are awarded in the name of Henrik Ibsen, among them the International Ibsen Award, the Norwegian Ibsen Award and the Ibsen Centennial Commemoration Award. Every year, since 2008, the annual Delhi Ibsen Festival, is held in Delhi, India, organized by the Dramatic Art and Design Academy, DADA, in collaboration with the Royal Norwegian Embassy in India. It features plays by Ibsen, performed by artists from various parts of the world in varied languages and styles. The Ibsen Society of America, ISA, was founded in 1978 at the close of the Ibsen Sesquicentennial Symposium held in New York City to mark the 150th anniversary of Henrik Ibsen's birth. Distinguished Ibsen translator and critic Rolf Fjelda, professor of literature at Pratt Institute and the chief organizer of the symposium, was elected founding president. In December 1979, the ESA was certified as a non-profit corporation under the laws of the state of New York. Its purpose is to foster through lectures, readings, performances, conferences, and publications an understanding of Ibsen's works as they are interpreted as texts and produced on stage and in film and other media. An annual newsletter Ibsen News and Comment is distributed to all members. Ibsen's ancestry has been a much-studied subject, due to his perceived foreignness and due to the influence of his biography and family on his plays. Ibsen often made references to his family in his plays, sometimes by name, or by modeling characters after them. The oldest documented member of the Ibsen family was ship's captain Rasmus Ibsen, 1632-1703, from Stige, Denmark. His son, ship's captain Peter Ibsen became a burgher of Bergen in Norway in 1726. Henrik Ibsen had Danish, German, Norwegian and some distant Scottish ancestry. Most of his ancestors belonged to the merchant class of original Danish and German extraction, and many of his ancestors were ship's captains. Ibsen's biographer Henry Kieger famously wrote in 1888 that Ibsen did not have a drop of Norwegian blood in his veins, stating that the ancestral Ibsen was a Dane. This, however, is not completely accurate, notably through his grandmother Hedevig Paus, Ibsen was descended from one of the very few familias of the patrician class of original Norwegian extraction, known since the 15th century. 
Ibsen's ancestors had mostly lived in Norway for several generations, even though many had foreign ancestry. The name Ibsen is originally a patronymic, meaning son of Ib. Ib is a Danish variant of Jacob. The patronymic became frozen, i.e. it became a permanent family name, in the 17th century. The phenomenon of patronymics becoming frozen started in the 17th century in bourgeois familias in Denmark, and the practice was only widely adopted in Norway from around 1900. From his marriage with Susanna Thorison, Ibsen had one son, lawyer and government minister Sigurd Ibsen. Sigurd Ibsen married Bergel Jot Björnsson, the daughter of Björnsterna Björnsson. Their son was Tancred Ibsen, who became a film director and was married to Lillable Ibsen. Their only child was diplomat Tancred Ibsen Jr. Sigurd Ibsen's daughter, Irene Ibsen, married Josias Bill, a member of the Danish ancient noble Bill family. Their son was Danish actor Joan Bill. Ibsen was decorated knight in 1873, commander in 1892, and with the Grand Cross of the Order of St. Olaf in 1893. He received the Grand Cross of the Danish Order of the Danabrog, and the Grand Cross of the Swedish Order of the Polar Star, and was knight, first class of the Order of Vesa. Well-known stage directors in Austria and Germany as Theodor Loeb, 1833-1905, Paul Barnet, 1884-1960, Max Burkhardt, 1854-1912, Otto Brahm, 1956-1912, Karl Heine, 1861-1927, Paul Albert Glazer Wilkin, 1874-1942, Victor Barnowski, 1875-1952, Eugene Robert, 1877-1944, Leopold Yesner, 1878-1945, Ludwig Barnet, 1884-1960, Alfred Rotter, 1886-1933, Fritz Rotter, 1888-1939, 1900-1973, and Peter Zadek, 1926-2009 performed the work of Ibsen. In 1995, the asteroid 5696 Ibsen was named in his memory. The authoritative translation in the English language for Ibsen remains the 1928 ten-volume version of the complete works of Henrik Ibsen from Oxford University Press. Many other translations of individual plays by Ibsen have appeared since 1928 though none have purported to be a new version of the complete works of Ibsen. There have been numerous adaptations of Ibsen's work, particularly in film, theater and music. Notable are Torstein Blixfjord's Tarja and Identity of the Soul, two multimedia, film and dance pieces first presented in Yokohama in 2006, based on the poem Tarja Vegan. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.